We would like to hope that the present series will advance two useful purposes. One is to contribute something to our historical and philosophical orientation in relation to ancient man, and the second to unfold a more or less comprehensive method for approaching highly controversial issues. We know that the Atlantean hypothesis is held to be a simple, inevitable fact by some who are unfortunately in a position where they cannot too strongly sustain their positions. It is also held to be a myth by others who have inadequate means of supporting their negative point of view. Thus actually, we are in the presence of a mystery story, a story which must be examined in the weight of such evidence as is available, recognizing with Aristotle that rational evidence is acceptable in any learned group. In other words, the workings of the reasoning faculties can as truly and completely demonstrate a fact as so-called scientific method. Nearly all so-called scientific fact has either come from reasoning process or led to it. Therefore, the facts, apart from reason, lose most of their utility. But reason, if trained, may achieve facts not demonstrable on the level of academic observation or experimentation. Thus we must try throughout this entire series to estimate our values, to gather such evidence as can be gathered, to interpret it with a largest of spirit which is consistent with good sense, thoughtfulness, and thoroughness. We are not seeking to attain an easy believing, but also we are not interested in denying merely because others have denied, or doubting because doubts are fashionable. What then is our basic problem. This problem deals with the existence of a comparatively important culture group at a time which we would generally regard as prehistoric. Perhaps better we should say that this group stands in the dim dawn light between prehistory and history. The moment we begin to consider this period, we learn several important negative facts. The first is that in spite of our achievements in many branches of learning, we have not been especially successful in pushing back the boundaries of history. We divide the world now into two distinct groups or periods, one historic and the other prehistorical. About prehistorical eras in general, we have a fair knowledge. We know something of the primitive man. We have the piltdown skull, the Neanderthal jaw, and things of this kind, uh, which tell us 
that at a remote period the primitive ancestors of humanity lived upon this earth struggled against the natural hazards of their times fought monstrous animals and perished into limbo leaving but primary and rudimentary artifacts or remnants of their survival by geology we come to some knowledge and uh, by the further aid of ethnology and anthropology we have a picture of the remote world we also have a fair picture of the modern world from the rise of the civilizations of Egypt and those which flourished in the valley of the Euphrates down to the present time it is this strange shadowy interval between the prehistoric world and the historical world that we know that gives us the most baffling problem we are unable to trace the emergence of civilized man as we know him we are also confronted with a curious circumstance that historical research sustains namely that for the most part history is the continuing record of the collapse of systems of cultures the decay of peoples the decline of nations the disintegration of empires history is almost an unbroken record of things dying fading away falling into neglect and oblivion thus our history of races is a history of decline and fall scattered around the earth are the prehistoric records and remnants of peoples called the old people these peoples we have neither any clear way of envisioning nor can we adequately re reconstruct their mode of life for the most part the records and remains of these people are to be found in stone carving or monument to such we must add the usual accumulation of the ancient rubbish pile broken pots ancient decorations primitive implements and equally primitive ornamentations yet as we look around through these early shadowy remnants of things we see flashes of considerable cultural insight we do not know where this insight came from but we observe a strange conglomeration of things extremely primitive and flashes of high genius uh, the artists who ornamented the interior of the caves of Spain with and France with their prehistoric drawings were not strictly speaking amateurs today modern art is seeking to capture the vitality expressed in these ancient prehistoric paintings the masters of old architecture who have left the ruins of temples shrines cities and monumental statues and memorials in various parts of the world were not strictly savages they possessed an unusual ingenuity they also revealed considerable mathematical astronomical scientific skill who were they where did they come from and where did they go one would think that persons specializing in these fields would be so intrigued 
by this riddle that they would be impelled to examine it, to give it greater consideration. This might well have been the case had it not been the scientific world rapidly developed a mass hypothesis, a grand strategy, and was content to permit supposedly or obviously irreconcilable factors uh, to remain comparatively unconsidered. It was much easier to ignore certain evidence than to change the grand concept which would not include it in a satisfactory manner. I think the problem in Mexico is indicative of the general train of thought. Down in the civilizations that extend from central Mexico practically to Peru, uh, there are several schools of archaeology that have been hard at work for many years. Uh, these schools can be roughly divided into three groups of thinkers. We will call them the American, the German, and the Mexican. Uh, these three schools represent three degrees of caution. And wherever we come in contact with these groups, we have more or less the same experience. Not far from the city of Mexico are the famous pyramids of the sun and moon at San Juan Teotihuacan. These pyramids, which most of you have seen at least reproduced in pictures, are monumental structures, obviously planned, well executed by a highly intelligent group of artisans and architects. So we can assume that we meet three of these archaeologists standing at the foot of the Pyramid of the Sun. We turn to the American archaeologist and we say, when were these pyramids built? And if he is a forthright man, he will say, probably, we really do not know. But you must certainly have some opinion on the matter. Oh, yes, we have that. Where facts are few, opinions are numerous. <laughs> well, when do you think they were built? Well, I would think, says the American archaeologist, that they were probably built about the 12th century A.D. Perhaps the 10th. And if we want to get very, very optimistic and run into danger of strong criticism from headquarters, we can suspect perhaps as early as the 7th or 8th century. But certainly, they are post-Christian in their monumental construction. But why do you say that? Well, we say it because it was not until the rise of the Tarascan peoples and other groups in the great plateau of Mexico until they had reached a certain culture level they could not have produced these monuments. They have to be recent. So you then turn to the Mexican archaeologist and you say what is your opinion? And he will say well we do not really know either. But uh, from our researching and from our thought, we suspect that these monuments are older than the American school believes. We would like to suspect that these monuments might go back a thousand, maybe two thousand years before the Christian era, and that they were built by peoples who preceded the historical group in the Valley of Mexico. This assumes, of course, the existence of a pre-Aztec culture in this area. And uh, to, according to the German viewpoint, the existence of such a culture is intimated in the remaining records of the Mahua peoples, for they distinctly seem to imply that these monuments were ancient at the time when they first 
reached the great plateau of Mexico. So the German scientist is inclined to be a little more generous. Then you turn to the Mexican scientist, who actually is in a strange way in the best condition and position to understand the achievements of his own people. He has had his ear to the ground for a long time, is well aware of the legendary and lore that are definitely parts of the descent of our records in this region. And with a typical Mexican shrug of the shoulders, he will say, we do not know when they were built, senor. It is our opinion that perhaps they were built 8,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. But we are convinced that they are far more ancient than has been suspected. And that the only reason why the present fashion is to insist that they are recent is because our whole concept of culture is based upon the concept that man's more recent state indicates a superior attainment. Therefore, that the man of the dawn of time could not have produced such monuments. Our picture of him does not permit him to have such ingenuity and advancement. But remember, that we have no picture of this man except the one we ourselves have invented. So that we are really locked by our own invention. We have come to a conclusion and we are trying to make the fat facts fit into the conclusion. In other words, we are reasoning from a conclusion and not toward one. This is generally speaking the attitude in nearly all parts of the world relating to ancient monuments. The modern materialistic school insisting upon everything being recent. The more conservative Teutonic mind being a little slower to arrive at such an end or finding. And the native peoples, whether scholarly or unscholarly, uniting in the concept of an extraordinary antiquity to certain of their most famous monumental structures. We do, of course, in some cases, enjoy native records. Our present tendency, however, is to assume that most natives are liars from the beginning, that either they have no knowledge of their own antiquity or have gone off into romancing and into myth and folklore to the degree that their records are not reliable. Actually, however, when we go back beyond a certain point, we have only mythology, only legendary, and only lore. If we eliminate these completely, we simply have no contact at all with man prior to the, pre, uh, to the dynastic rise in Egypt. Thus we can say that some of these buildings may be recent, some of them may be ancient. Explorations on the site of the Great Pyramid of Kukul Khan at Chichen Itza on the peninsula of Yucatan now indicates one building under another and various estimates of from 9 to 15 structures inside of that one temple have already been advanced indicating a sacred site rebuilt or overbuilt many times over a vast period of history. Thus, by degrees, the need for a concept of a culture, a comparatively advanced culture, appears over the horizon as we begin to seek reasonable or rational explanations for familiar things. So much for the physical level of our functioning. Now let us move to an entirely different uh, theater of consideration. A different area requiring penetration. We are completely confused as to the origin of language. We have some rather skillful thoughts about it, 
but still we are unable to explain a number of important things. We accept much, question little, and hope for the best. On another level, equally important, we are without any adequate knowledge as to the origin of the sciences that we now consider basic. Who invented mathematics and when? This question would really uh, probably prove disconcerting even to the best historian of mathematics. We simply do not know. Wherever we find the person or the condition which seems to suggest origination, we immediately strike a legend or immediately strike a statement of that person that his knowledge was derived from some other source. We cannot pin down the original of these different forms of learning. This is especially true when we turn from history to Stonehenge or to the great Druidic or pre-Druidic monuments in Brittany in France. Here immense mazes, tremendous architectural structures covering huge areas and arranged with considerable mathematical skill must certainly precede the periods in which we believed mathematics to be available to man. We are therefore searching religiously, philosophically, scientifically, ethnologically, anthropologically for the beginning of the human race. Not its physical beginning, merely as creature, but the beginning of its ascent from savagery or a primitive state uh, to the levels or to the platforms which can come within investigation by available instruments. Where then can we turn? The, probably the only way we can turn is this, that in which most have turned, who have sought to penetrate the almost intentional wall of oblivion that has been built up by opinion, attitude, and prejudice between us and the origin of our own culture. Men like Baron de Prorock, seeking vestiges of ancient foundations off the coast of Europe. Men like Leo Frobenius, seeking the solution of the mystery of Africa. These men instinctively associate their problem with a prehistorical empire or a prehistorical diffusion of a high culture and have found it convenient to accept uh, the general term Atlantean to suggest that culture in the light of the celebrated account left by Plato. So let us think for a moment about Plato's record as we are to deal first in our first evening with the Greek-Egyptian foundation of the Atlantic fable. We have every reason to believe that the discussion of the Atlantic island contained in the writings of Plato arose from the maturity of his years and has been preserved for us in the collected works of one of the greatest minds and the most admired intellects that humanity has produced. It would be difficult indeed to assume that the author of The Statesman and The Republic, the man whose mind so accurately and astutely estimated nearly every social and human problem, could have merely been fictionalizing or have been himself easily deceived by some legend or lore 
the actual story of Atlantis, as recorded by Plato, came to him from one of his disciples, a young man descended from the old Athenian lawgiver, Solon. Solon, who flourished about the 6th century B.C., was one of the seven wise men of Greece. And it is very important to realize at this time that Solon is not included among philosophers, nor is he considered a mystic. He is not regarded as a scientist, and he was certainly not a theologian. Solon was exactly uh, what our modern semantic association with the word Solon would indicate. He was a statesman. As a statesman, he was bound to the political and physical problems of his country. His primary contribution to Athenian life was his solution to the problem of the mortgage stones, which were heaped up on the corners of land to indicate various easements and various financial liens upon the properties. As during the course of centuries these properties changed hands and were mortgaged and remortgaged, a situation of considerable complication arose. The heaps of mortgage stones became so large there was no land left to till. So Solon had to fight with the problem of the ancestral and historical indebtedness of the Greek peoples. He solved this rather neatly and also is remembered as the man who liberated the Grecians from the unhappy and difficult law permitting imprisonment for debt. It was not until the Middle Ages in Europe that this law was revived, and we are happy to say that it is now gone. If it wasn't gone today, there'd be no one out of jail. <laughs> now, uh, Solon visited Egypt because of the general respect of the Grecians for the political and diplomatic skill of the Egyptian rulers. Egypt was a theocracy, uniting in the person of the pharaoh both priest and king. Egypt was also deeply versed in ancient laws and had a very skillfully developed system of legislation and jurisprudence. Solon went there, not in order to discover lost continents, but to find out some way to remove the mortgage stones. It was during this trip that the priests of Sais communicated to him the legend of the lost Atlantis. Solon was profoundly affected by the story, which he undoubtedly received as an historical fact. He was shown a pillar of mysterious metal, which was said by these priests to have been erected prior to the destruction of Atlantis, and to have carved upon its face in hieroglyphics the story of the great catastrophe. So on, hastening back to Greece, became involved in the proper administration of his statescraft problems. Being a man of advanced years, he tells us that he was unable to advance and philosophize the story of Atlantis. He therefore left it as he had received it, in record only, passing it on to his descendants. And one of these descendants finally brought it to the attention of Plato. The record has also some dating. So on, as we say, flourished about 600 B.C. And according to the ancient story, the Atlantic invasion of the Greek states occurred about 9,000 years before the birth of Solon. This would put it somewhat in the neighborhood of 11,500 years ago. This kind of dating brings us into an arena of timing in which modern man has almost no records.
a period in which, however, it is inconceivable to him that a great culture could have flourished. Remember, this culture was important in the terms of the Greeks and Egyptians. Therefore, we have every reason to assume that whatever this Atlantean culture was, it was not like ours, but if it had a parallel, would have been more like that of those ancient nations of four, five, or six thousand years ago with, with which we have some historical acquaintance. According to the Egyptians, uh, the Atlanteans attempted the conquest of Europe. And in the course of this conquest, they moved apparently without opposition until they reached the Greek area. And here they had their first serious adversary. During the wars and struggles which ensued, the Atlantic continent sank, leaving the armies that had reached Europe and undoubtedly had permeated a large part of the European area without a homeland, without any place to return. Also, undoubtedly, at that time, this disaster was far less significant than it would have been in terms of a modern military expedition. Even 4,000 years ago, and certainly five or six, armies did not move as bodies of military people. They moved as migrations of total social groups. The army or the leader leading an expedition into a remote area carried with him all his worldly goods, his family, his livestock, everything necessary for his survival. It is quite likely that in many of those older campaigns, uh, the original members of the expedition, even had they been spared or were they spared in war, would never return home. It would be their great-grandchildren who might return if any, because there was almost no contact between these migrant armies and the land from which they originated. Uh, they might well settle in some new region and never go back, becoming the nucleus of a new culture group. So it is not so likely that the Atlantean armies uh, were gravely perturbed by the destruction of their homeland. They may have already been away from it a hundred, two hundred years, with little memory by descent of the original area, and that memory already highly dramatized and romanticized. Plato and the Egyptians both failed to tell us what happened to the migrant armies of the Atlantean expeditionary forces. Obviously, they could not go home. They seemed to disappear. And they disappeared at a time, thousands of years before the Trojan War. Some have advanced the possibility that these Atlantean migrants finally come into historical memory as the Egyptian people that perhaps the Egyptians were these Atlanteans, that they gradually took over this area, bringing with them the cultural background of previous achievement. This might explain why we have no clear evidence of the origin of arts or sciences in Egypt. Why it also happens that the earliest Egyptian records indicate a people highly advanced, culturally, scientifically, philosophically, and religiously. We do not know where these people came from, nor do we know where the Atlanteans went. On the same ground, we have comparatively little knowledge of a primitive state of Europe. We have some. 
we can envision the Europe of the Goths and the Vandals. But far deeper than these records are the ancient cultural institutions of the Druids and of the various Bardic orders that were behind uh, the common ways of things. The Druids were a very learned people, as Caesar testifies. Where did they derive their learning? It has been common to assume that they had some connection with Asia. How? Where? When? None of these questions are adequately answered. Solon, in his legend, or the story which he received, therefore gives an almost starkly simple report that at a certain time these invasions took place. He does not dramatize them in his own story what, in any way whatever. Nor does he imply that the Egyptians, a rather factual people, dramatized the story. They presented it to him as a simple historical account, but unfortunately did not give him the details which might have clarified the whole issue. Later, when the descendant of Solon provided the material for the famous dialogue, the Critias of Plato, we find the master of philosophy moving in upon the fable. Plato gives us an account far more explicit than that of Solon, in much greater detail and with much more glamour. Where did Plato secure the material for this embellishment? No one knows. This embellishment, however, follows in itself a kind of pattern. It follows the pattern of Greek mythology. It assumes, therefore, that when the twelve deities divided the earth, that the seas and the great oceans were assigned to the deity Poseidon, and that from him and from his descendants came the mysterious empire of Poseidonius. Thus, Plato, borrowing again from mythology, declares that Atlas, the man who carried the world on his shoulders, was an ancient Atlantean king. And he further, Plato further, points out the tremendously vital code of laws uh, given by Poseidon to his people and to his children the laws which became the basis of the great legislative system of the Atlantean state. <coughs> These laws, incidentally, are practically identical with those set forth in the basic code of the great Babylonian Chaldean system, the code of Hammurabi. Thus we have Plato implying that a great culture, a powerful religion, important mysteries or secret religious institutions originated in this great Atlantean nation. Plato then explains to us something that, can it be demonstrated, would be of the greatest importance. He speaks strongly of the maritime achievements of the Atlantean peoples. The great city of the Golden Gates on the island of Atlantis was actually a vast harbor. <clears throat> and into this harbor came the shipping of the Atlanteans who were a great mercantile people. Their boats and galleys and crafts went throughout the world, merchandising, bartering, exchanging, trading. Plato does not specifically state colonizing, but let us move it there for a moment and consider what might be implied. A factual story gives us some help. 
We know that the Chaldeans, at a comparatively early period, uh, sailed along the coasts of Western Europe, reaching as far as Britain and the Scandinavian countries to engage in the merchandising of tin. And we know that wherever these ancient expeditions came and visited, they left not only the immediate objects of barter, but a cultural impact upon the peoples that they visited. In other words, wherever the Chaldeans bartered, they left something of their philosophy and their culture, further testified to by the experiences of Caesar in interrogating the wise people of Gaul and Brittany. Thus the migration of a great mercantile project traveling into very far areas would certainly imply the establishment of trading centers, trading posts outposts of one kind or another, and even permanent settlements. The trader is always the same, and along the routes of his journey he leaves indelible impressions of his vices, his virtues, and his achievements. This brings us to another important situation. Is Plato romancing? Was it possible for an Atlantean merchant fleet to travel any extraordinary distance? Two questions then present themselves. What was the general geographical state of the Atlantic area at this time? Assuming that the central mountains of the Atlantean continent island, which may have been nearly as large as Australia, Perhaps this area was connected with islands or other smaller, unsubmerged, uh, scattered fragments of land, so that contact between Europe and America, by means of this continent and islands, might not have been a great challenge to navigation. The Seminole Indians in Florida have record of a land bridge that once extended all the way from America to Europe. While we may want to think that the Seminoles are not the world's outstanding historians, and there is some ground for this opinion, on the other hand, the Seminoles, like most primitive people, have no reason to misrepresent. It is meaningless to them. There is nothing to be gained, no purpose whatever, because they are not solving any problem and they were in need of no hypothesis. They were only telling the story of their people. They were preserving the record of some migration of their own ancestors, which they regarded as worth preserving. Another point in this po situation is what would be the probabilities of navigation by primitive instruments such as old galleys, sailing boats, or even canoes. There are at the present time in the Polynesian Islands huge canoes which have cruising range of over 2,000 miles. This, therefore, tells us that long journeys were not impossible. We know that these canoes are really, in skillful hands, far more practical, serviceable, and efficient than the tiny ships with which Columbus crossed the ocean. That the ancients had the possibility of ships equal to or better than those of Columbus, we have no reason to doubt. The Egyptians, during the uh, dynasties of the Ptolemies, had a great galley of state in which they entertained distinguished guests, which had not only sails but three banks of oars, 
two swimming pools and a grove of live fruit trees on the deck. We are not informed as to just how seaworthy the ship was, but at the same time, the idea of large vessels certainly goes back much earlier than the rise of the Hamburg American line. Also, it was not important that such journeys be rapid or immediate, because these people were not leaving relatives at home that they wished to get back to by the holidays. When they left, they probably never expected to return, so they took their relatives with them. The Japanese are convinced that exploration from their shores as early as the 12th century reached by degrees as far south as Lima in Peru. And we know that on certain currents, it is very certain the Chinese reached the coast of California at least 600 B.C. Therefore, empirically, we cannot say that a considerable mercantile could not have existed, especially if the distances to be traveled were greatly reduced by a large land area in the midst of what is now the ocean. Perhaps there was no area that would have required any unusual means of travel. Even as we can follow the Aleutian Islands and things of that nature and make a reasonably safe trip from the Western Hemisphere to Asia. These considerations, then, do not tell us that Plato would have been romancing unduly. He was aware of the strength of the then existing Greek fleet. He also knew of the Egyptian navy and what it had accomplished and what it could accomplish. He knew that people far less skillful and less strategically placed had also conquered a smaller sea of their own, the Mediterranean. All these things were matters of degrees, not involving any major <coughs> policy change. Let us assume then for a moment that in the course of their mercantile activity, trading and bartering for some reason, Plato does not, does not tell us what they were seeking to merchandise. Perhaps like many powerful nations, they had built up a great level of luxury in their own culture, and that their people and their nation, which probably numbered some 60 million at its height, was a tremendous market for rare and remarkable goods from strange places. And even as the Assyrians are known to have brought foods, spices, and fine fabrics seven and eight thousand miles for their luxury use, we do not know that it could not, that it could not be that the Atlanteans wished to trade in these materials for their own enjoyment or for the raising of their own cultural level. But almost certainly, some kind of colonization had to accompany a large expanding program of mercantile. We have in the more recent times of our own world the same situation arising. The expanding power of the British Empire in the 17th and 18th centuries resulted in a vast colonization program, the establishment of such groups as the Virginia Company, the Hudson's Bay Company, the East India Company, and others, for the purpose of distributing these various wares which could be gathered from other countries. The uh, gathering of the material in these other countries required central storage areas, such as the treaty ports that were set up along the coast of China in the closing years of the last century. Such programs must have carried with them cultural infusions. 
Every colonizing program in the last thousand years has spiritually, morally, intellectually, and culturally affected all peoples involved in this colonization. And in spite of the fact that only selfishness may have dominated the original program, these colonizing plans have always finally resulted in the raising of native levels and have opened the way for the future independence of these once colonized and dominated groups. We have no reason, therefore, to assume that Plato was mad or completely impractical. If he tells us something which we have seen repeated a hundred times since, and have seen repeated by peoples of a much more complicated nature, and with situations that might have suggested other means of handling, but we have still followed the old traditional ways. If, then, it is conceivable that this Atlantic center did have a broad area which, like the spokes of a wheel moving outward from the central hub, finally diverged to an incredible rim area. We have one possible answer to the question of how almost completely isolated peoples, among whom there is no historical record of contact, and who have been separated by what appeared to be impassable intervals of mountains, land, or water, could have, at approximately the same time, been enriched by certain basic additions to their ways of life. In thinking of this, let us turn to these some of these peoples. Even the Greeks do not or did not believe that they originated their own culture. They said that their culture came to them by a mysterious person from a distant place. If you go into the Polynesians, if you go into the Northwestern American Indians, or the Southwest Indians, or the Old Iroquois League, or the Plains Indians, if you go into the Eskimos' uh, culture, or to China, Japan, India, Persia, Syria, Assyria, Egypt, there is not one of these culture groups that will take the responsibility for having originated its own culture. This is important. While we have only myths to work with, that is true, every one of these groups of myths tell essentially the same origin story, that the peoples came from elsewhere, that they came with leaders who had led them from some previous location, that these leaders were responsible for the establishment of higher orders of culture in primitive areas. Thus the natural or aboriginal peoples of these areas all insist that their cultures began with the advent of divine beings who came from remote places, from a long distance, from other lands. These remote beings did not resemble the people to whom they came. They wore different clothing. They spoke a different language. But in each case, they brought ideas. And from these ideas, the cultures of these local groups derived their impulse and their inspiration. Now, when you find this scattered throughout the earth, and you find almost identical cultures developing around these myths, so that Max Miller, the great German Orientalist, was actually correct when he said that there was never a false religion unless a child is a false man, that all these people came to the same basic ideas and that as cultures developed, they de developed around identical institutions. The astronomy of India, 
although we do not know where it came from, is not essentially different from the astronomy of Egypt, nor is it different from that of China, nor of that of Greece. And European astronomy is indebted to this entire background. Even in languages, identical words are to be found. Dr. Laplonion, exploring both Egypt and the Western Hemisphere, made a list of hundreds of Maya words, he knew the language, which were identical with Egyptian words of same meaning. And also he made many drawings of glyphs, which show that the Egyptian words and glyphs for certain objects were identical with the words and glyphs assigned to them in the Western Hemisphere. The only answer to this is that there was a migration of ideas. And uh, Plato's hypothesis seems to provide us with an adequate explanation for this migration of ideas. Furthermore, we find no evidence among other peoples of any mass migrational efforts there is no other people known on the earth today in the mythology of which we find any clearly defined statement that that people was responsible for a powerful inflection of world culture. In other words, the Greeks do not say that they educated the Western Hemisphere. The Egyptians do not say that they ever had anything to do with China. India does not claim that it is responsible for Central American civilization, nor can the Central American civilization, dear old Dr. Plongen to the contrary, nevertheless, actually claim that it was responsible for the rise of Syria, Palestine, the Near East, and the emirs of Afghanistan. No existing people meets the need of the problem at hand, nor does any existing people claim to ever have fulfilled that need. And though their myths be many, this type of mythology is not to be found. But the mythology that someone else came to them is universally present. One of the difficulties, of course, that we confront in all of these situations is the comparatively recent rise of a trustworthy chronological system. We have a reasonable system in China by which we can push back dates two or three thousand years before the Christian era, but after that we are dissipated in mythology again. We can integrate the concept of Egyptian dating perhaps six to seven thousand years. In India, we are not quite so fortunate as far as chronological material is concerned. The Maya chronological system, which is perhaps one of the most perfect in the world, has only a comparatively recent history in the Western Hemisphere, and their own system of chronology implies definitely that it was set up elsewhere long before. But we do not have any trustworthy system of dating. We cannot raise the question, therefore, what were these people doing 10,000 years ago? We have no chronology to assist us to differentiate these periods. In fact, we could not spot them within several thousands of years. Thus, we have only legendary. We have only the concept of the long, long ago. We are back to the most elusive of all dates, once upon a time, where every legend, fairy story, and fragment of folklore has its beginning. This once upon a time, however, has one interesting demonstrable element. This once upon a time is related to Ariel. 
And we are able to gather to some degree a picture of timing from location. We are not even able to fall back upon the trusty old tree rings because we don't know which trees were there at the moment. We have no way of actually clearing this situation. We have only the broad picture of many peoples to whom things happened once upon a time. We do know, however, that this once upon a time was already in vogue and well used, being accepted as ancient lore as early as 7,000 years ago. We know that the ancient peoples of the Valley of the Euphrates and of Egypt referred to ancient times in their earliest recorded works. So the historians and the storytellers of the old dynasties were using once upon a time just as we are. And this must imply that the term originates prior uh, to the rise of these historical states as we know them. If then we shall assume some of these things, we must turn back now and try to appraise our Atlantean. What manner of man was this? Who was he? What kind of a person? Is it true that great scientists and philosophers and scholars flourished in this empire of the Golden Gates 50, 25,000 years ago? Did some strange catastrophe wipe out the first spaceships, aeroplanes? Were these people great scientists? Are we merely struggling to regain what they once knew? It's all very dramatic, very interesting, and very difficult. Actually, we have to develop our premises very largely from the only record that we have in the Near Eastern area, in the Mediterranean area, and that is Plato. He tells us that they had great laws, good laws. He tells us that they built a great temple to the deity Poseidon, and that in this temple was a magnificent statue of the deity, that these people worked precious metals, that they were able to plate the walls of their city with orichalcum, a mysterious metal of the greatest hardness, like the plates or scales of a suit of armor. These people had armor, spears, bow and arrow, or at least some similar weapon. They were able to make war, and they were sufficiently aggressive so that it was not until the Athenians arose against them that they met any uh, resistance in their migration. They domesticated the horse, which was sacred to the god who was the ruler of their land. They, are t they possessed the knowledge of the tilling of the soil, and from the description of their harbors, their earthworks, their ships, their laws, their ancient hierarchical orders, the descent of their rulers, their princely and priestly families, their knowledge of medicine, law, and science. From all these fragments put together, we must have been in the presence of a reasonably advanced type of person. Now this does not mean, by any circumstance, that we must regard the Atlantean as a miracle or a wonder of wonders. All we need to do is to see him standing in the background of the ancient world, standing against the background of the great um, dynasties of Babylonia and Egypt,
standing perhaps almost like some vast pre-Egyptian in the midst of the city which he had built, the city of great monuments and pyramids, a wonderful city on a wonderful land, fertile, which he was able to cultivate, where he had learned to gather the fruits of the fields and to sow the grain. He had gained much knowledge. It would be almost inconceivable that the gods of the islands would have written tablets inscribing them with their instructions, and this Plato simply tosses in, had not the people had a written language. Nor would he be likely to refer to these achievements had they no histories or historical records. So we must assume that perhaps as in the case of Egypt or Greece, that some at least of the Atlanteans were literate, that they possessed a written language and could preserve history, that they could also preserve chronology, and that perhaps they are some almost hypothetical Maya, a learned person such as those met by Cortes when he arrived in the Western world and beheld for the first time the Venice of America, the city of floating ships and islands ruled over by the wise and colorful Montezuma. Now, how do we gain any further knowledge of this? We gain it again by going to the myths of these <coughs> circumference peoples. The mysterious beings who came to them in the dawn of time, responsible for their advancement and their knowledge, are always attributed as possessing such attributes as we have listed. In other words, they were persons wearing armor, apparently a kind of chain or scale armor, which caused them to resemble fishes, that these people also came in boats, that they could navigate, and that when they reached the land, they brought with them in every instance a culture level higher than that of the people to whom they came. The picture is therefore that at least in the area under consideration, this colonizing was into primitive regions, as was the case in the 18th and 19th century in many cases, and that these various merchants or maritime adventurers actually developed primitive peoples and secured from them valuable commodities. In exchange, they left the inevitable record of their presence. Perhaps they sent missionaries. Perhaps they established permanent colonies. These things we cannot know with certainty. Now, if this was occurring 10, 12, 14,000 years ago, 20,000 perhaps, what was the state of the rest of the world? What was the state of the rest of the world when Great Britain produced its colonial empire? It was not a world of Great Britain and savagery. It was a world of several great cultures and a world in which by its own peculiar uh, nature and skill, Great Britain was able to create this vast mercantile commonwealth. Now, it is not at all necessary that at the time of the Atlanteans, no other civilized people existed. There is much to indicate that great migrations moving from northern Asia were also to be considered as important for the beginning of the great Aya migration, which was to finally take the place of the Atlantean world and to dominate the culture which we now know, was certainly underway moving into the theater of world affairs down through the valley of the Sin and the great Indo-Gangetic plain of India. It is quite probable like, uh, likewise that the migrations of this Atlantean area might have carefully avoided uh, large and powerful nations 
that also had existence. It may never have reached them, having been limited largely to the great Atlantic area. Or it may have reached them and fraternized with them. We have no record that it warred with them. Plato would imply from his account that there was no such thing as war as we know it until it was developed by the Atlanteans, that they were the first mortals to engage in war. If such is the case, perhaps they were the first whose ambitions, perhaps towards world dominion, brought them into conflict with the ambitions of others or brought down there upon them the resentments of exploited groups or pillaged uh, culture systems. However we may wish to view this, Plato then moves into a moral ethical consideration in which he points out that the destruction of Atlantis was due to the disobedience of the princes and their peoples who departed from the laws which had been given to them by their divine father, the God of the seas. And as retribution for these errors, terrible catastrophes descended upon them, and they were destroyed. Plato's account ends at this point. No one knows why. It is possible that Solon's account also so ends, or that Plato concerned with other essays neglected this one or perhaps purposely he intended it to go no further in any event we have the powerful concept of such a cultural center this causes us then to begin to patch together the framework and remnants of the old cultures of the world in an effort to discover, if we can, such common material as could well have been derived from a single source. We have considerable such material available to us. For example, one of the earliest accounts relating to this arriving out of the sea of the stranger on his ship or on upon his raft of serpents, is that uh, related to Dagon, uh, the Babylonian Chaldean culture hero. Dagon, or Oannes, the man who came out of the sea with the body of a human, with the head of a human being and the body of a fish, might well represent our mysterious Atlantean uh, merchant or navigator. That he came out of the sea means merely that he came over the horizon. That he was riding upon a dragon means only that he came upon a ship. The messengers of Montezuma thought that Cortez had arrived on a dragon and declared they had seen it from the shore. So we can pretty well consider what this means. Perhaps dragon carving on the bow of a boat. Perhaps merely the sail or the oars resembling many legs led a very primitive people to believe that a sea monster had risen before them. In any event, what was the first thing uh, that this sea man taught to the people in the valley of the Euphrates? The first thing that he is said to have given them was good government. <coughs> good government meaning social organization. He taught them the importance of cooperation, of the building of tribal or national consciousness, of giving them community life, of having them settle to become a, a, the dwellers in towns and villages, to end their ancient wanderings. He also taught them to cook their food, which previously they had eaten raw. He taught them that it was not necessary merely to fish for their food with a bone hook. He taught them how to snare and capture animals. He taught them how to weave cloth. These are things that are particularly related to these cultured deities. <coughs> 
to till the soil, to gather medicinal herbs, uh, to treat various kinds of sickness, to organize a calendar for the historical and chronological preservation of that, their dates, and also a written language in which they could preserve records. Furthermore, he taught them uh, to build the laws by laws of architecture, and in several cases he is accredited with having given them music. He is certainly associated with basic arts and sciences and crafts. And before the complete completion of his mysterious sojourn with them, he had given them the momentum, the impetus, uh, to achieve to a new level of social greatness. Now, in several instances, we observe thinly veiled what may be the realistic answer to the problem, namely that this same same man taught them to gather various plants, taught them to mine the earth, uh, taught them to catch birds for beautiful plumage, and also to raise special fruits and harvests, leading to their prosperity. This implies that this visitor was setting up a proper situation for an exchange of goods. In other words, he was helping these people to develop skills, presumably with the idea that after they had produced this goods, he would take it and merchandise it for them. Furthermore, there is evidence that this stranger left artifacts behind him. He left things that had belonged to his people. These became sacred relics regarded with the most profound veneration. Now, as we begin to analyze this stranger who came from the sea, we almost inevitably come to the conclusion that he could not have been one but many. And this is again sustained by the records. For the records in Chaldea alone seem to point to at least five persons concealed under the identity of Dagon, or Oannes, the fishman. These persons visited the area at widely different periods, but had similar missions and identical contributions to make. And gradually, in prehistory, these personalities were either considered as one person with a phenomenal length of life, or as re-embodiments or returns of this one person on a religious level as avatars or re-embodiments. So we look this over with a rather critical thought in mind. We seem to observe a great deal of solid common sense. We have someone coming at that time to a people, establishing perhaps, as in the case in Mexico, where it is said Quetzalcoatl brought with him a retinue of persons of his own kind and established a kind of court or community. In some instances, the emphasis is upon religious matters, but always it is upon advancement. And in every instance, the same second act takes place. The strangers departed in due course, usually having appointed a successor or someone from among the people to carry on the program that had been started. In each case, the strangers promised to return, and in no case did they return. This is, I think, also important. Always the stranger said he would come back. Always he warned the people to keep the rules and laws because he would come back and find out whether they had or not. Also this stranger emphasized the need for honesty and for integrity and for dedication. 
and he warned the people not to abuse the knowledge which he had given them, stating that if they did abuse this knowledge, they would destroy themselves. So with fond adieus of one kind or another, this mythological ancestor, this psychological forebear, vanished back into the sea again. He always went about for the same mysterious road of water by which he had come. His ship or his dragon seemed to vanish under the ocean, and he was never seen again. And his people waited for him, and they kept his rules, sometimes for centuries and thousands of years. And many, even in the world today, whether we realize it or not, are still keeping those ancient rules and still waiting for the return of the hero who came out of the sea. Where you find this may be in 40 or 50 scattered culture groups, it has to have a meaning. There has to be something under it. We can say psychologically that perhaps it originates within man. This can be advanced and sustained with some logic. But it does not explain the lack of certain growth factors. These primitive people say and demonstrate by their later action. Yesterday we were savages. Then this man came. And immediately we were no longer savages. Within 50 years, within 20 years, within 100 years at most, these primitive peoples began to record their history. They changed their grass huts into great buildings. Sciences, arts, and crafts burst into bloom. Here they are. Yesterday they were not. And they tell us that the reason why this change was so rapid was because this knowledge was given to them. It was not evolved the slow and difficult way requiring thousands of years of gradual cultivation. This was given to them as a kind of birthright, a heritage. And they took it upon themselves and in a very short time gained astonishing proficiency. Consider the modern situation. As a result of the entrance of higher culture groups into primitive areas, many backward areas of our earth have been completely transformed in 150 years. We know this is happening. And we know that within the next 50 years, many new states and nations that 200 years ago were savages will sit as civilized human beings at the tables of our conferences. Thus rapidly does this contact bring with it the change in the state of things. This may also explain why, under the tremendous impulse of this almost divine mystery, for with ancient peoples everything that cannot be understood is sacred, under the impulse of this hero and the legends rising around him, Small groups of persons became the custodians of the deeper phases of his laws. The knowledge that he could not or would not wish to have forgotten was communicated to the old ones, the priests. They apparently were among his earliest converts, the local native wise men. He formed them into schools into a kind of group of elders, perhaps his form of a privy council or of a legislative body to surround him and protect him and advance his projects. When he was gone, these legislators he had trained became the keepers of his wisdom. They are the ones that then proceeded to initiate young people into this body as time went on so that the secrets could not be lost. In some cases, the secrets were lost. Some cultures became totally extinct, and we have no remnant or record of them as surviving. 
In the stronger and more healthy groups, however, there was survival. And this survival means that in a reasonably short length of time, these peoples emerged almost simultaneously or very closely uh, allied in time sequences. And that suddenly the curtain of history rolls up and we see history. And we see it coming into our understanding. But behind this history is nothing but secrets. Ancient institutions dedicated to the gods, to the sciences, to the arts, and to the religions. Each of these gods part of a strange order of beings. Now let us remind ourselves of one other thing, that even in the times of Plato and Thales and the other great Greek thinkers, there was a hypothesis strongly held that the gods had originally been mortals. Also, among the Egyptians, Plutarch tells us that the great gods of Egypt were antediluvian kings who had been deified after death. Now this has more or less disappeared from our thinking, but perhaps it also has a bearing upon this present consideration. We do not mean to imply uh, that all religion rises merely from prehistoric history. We do mean to imply, however, that between man as a worshipping being, worshipping the great creative principles of life, and man in his present complicated theological structure, there is an interval of interpretation, of impersonation, of personification, by means of which hierarchies or pantheons of divinities have arisen in nearly all parts of the world. These divinities, in most instances, like the Olympian gods, the aces of Scandinavia or the great Egyptian gods of Philae and Luxor, these deities have their stories. They have their histories. They have legends about them. They have their persecutions and their problems, their fortunes and their misfortunes. Uh, they were sometimes victorious and sometimes defeated, and they were subject to most of the moods that mortals can understand. The Egyptians and Greeks believed that these secondary orders of deities might very well have been originally human beings living at a remote time and with unique achievements by means of which they became the patrons and were recognized as divine by lesser peoples to whom they brought culture and enlightenment. This would again fit into our hypothesis. If, for example, there was a cultured people, a highly civilized people, that took some kind of a paternal interest in the then wandering nomadic tribes that are now the nations of the world. If such cultivated persons existed, we have no record of them whatever except in that mysterious account of the time when the gods walked the earth prior to the rise of the ordinary human way of life. Every people have this, has this account. The account that once upon a time the gods were among them, taught them, worked with them, gave them their privileges, established their priesthood, set up their monarchies, so that ancient peoples all believed themselves to have been descendants of deities, and even the emperor of Japan believes that his dynasty goes back to the goddess Amiterasu Omikami, the goddess of the sun, a divine being from whom a human dynasty proceeded. Everywhere it is the same. Ancient rulers governed by the divine right of kings, and this divine right was by descent from the heavenly kings that preceded the human rulers. This thinking could, 
uh, take considerable interpretation. For it could well be that behind the history, this dim band that we cannot penetrate, uh, is the band of these ancient gods. Now let us appropriate a scientific, philosophical, psychological thought. Supposing, we assume, that six or seven thousand years ago, primitive men, having attained, however, a measure of culture, began to contemplate their own origin. Suppose, for example, that the Eskimo or some of the totem Indians had a long history and were going back to try to develop a concept of where they came from and who these great gods were from whom they were descended. If they could go back to the earliest forms of their legends, there's one important thing that we must bear in mind. It is very difficult for any people or even an individual to imagine clearly a state superior to himself unless he is in the presence of example. It is quite possible for a primitive man of today, having seen a civilized man, to imagine him. But if the primitive man had never seen a civilized man and knew of no other kind of creature than himself, it is very doubtful if he could have imagined a group of ancestors or predecessors sublimely superior to himself. He would not have known how to describe them or what to call them. He could not imagine the origin of his clan being any different from the world that he knew. Yet our primitive forebears, arising from a primitive state, all had a clear concept of the existence in the world prior to their time of a culture system supremely advanced beyond their own. Thus the Greeks at their very dawn uh, contemplating upon the gods of the great Hyperborean range or the gods who abode north of the winds saw Olympus as a magnificent assembly not only of rather human gods, but also of great attainments, of great skill, and of supreme authority, wisdom, and power. The gods of Greece and Egypt were great gods, looking down upon their world. And those who first envisioned them and gave us the ancient legends about them give us legends of a highly sophisticated nature, totally inconsistent with the people among whom these legends arose. Thus we may question not only the spontaneous development of a people in an unreasonably short time by their own efforts, or that these peoples, while still comparatively primitive, would attribute their growth by imagination alone to a specifically cultured group superior to themselves. These things do not normally occur in human psychology. And if probably anything, our ancestor was more normal than we are, because he did not have the confused and complicated social structures that make life difficult for us. So here we are with a new group of elements to consider. Let us take one of these elements and trace it briefly. Where uh, did our religious insight arise? When Quetzalcoatl reached the shores of the Western Hemisphere, the man who came on the raft of serpents, he brought with him the worship of one God. When all, when the ancient Oannes came to the shores of Babylonia. He brought the worship of one God. When Fu He, the great primitive ancestor of China, the man born out of the body of a fish, 
who rose from the sea and gave to the Chinese the mystery of the trigrams and the great writing. When he came to them, he brought to them the worship of one God, Shanti, imperial heaven. When Vishnu, in India, in the embodiment of the first avatar, born out of the body of a fish, and so created to rescue the law which had been carried to the bottom of the ocean by a demon. When this being came forth to become the inspiration of the great Puranic literature of India, he taught the worship of one God. When Virakaka came to Peru, he taught the existence of one God. And wherever we go, it is the same. These primitive peoples apparently had worshipped idols or had worshipped fetishes or had merely the primitive juju magic of the Vuitton and the African primitive. But immediately, these leaders appeared. They brought the message of the one true father they taught that this father was invisible. They taught that this father was not embodied, but that, it, that this spirit dwelt everywhere, in everything, and the Incas of Peru worshipped it by kissing the wind. They also believed in the importance of light as the symbol of the invisible power. And the Peruvians had a concept of the sun almost identical with that of Akhenaten in Egypt nearly 2,000 years earlier. This, this power that came, this teacher, brought basic religious ideas. These ideas spread wherever this teaching spread. But the spreading was confined to levels. And as Plutarch also tells us, the candidate for initiation into the mysteries was ultimately initiated into the mystery of the one true God. Not known to the people but having been given to the mysteries by their divine founders long before. Is it any more difficult to assume that these divine founders represented a, an ancient culture level than it is to believe that these divine founders are to be understood as actual deities who took upon themselves bodies at their pleasures wandered about the earth like Voten and uh, instructed a few whom they pleased. Is one hypothesis more difficult than the other? It seems to me that it is much more natural to assume that a man learns from his father and that this father is his progenitor, his instructor, than it is that he learns from some invisible power that visits him remotely or occasionally according to some strange and unpredictable whim. So it would appear very reasonable. Now if these teachers from far places had brought only abstract ideas, we could say inspiration, instinct, intuition, would be applicable. But when among a widely diversified group specific technical knowledge is communicated simultaneously over large areas, we must begin to question the pure intuitive hypothesis. It seems far more reasonable to assume that these teachings were derived from some previous and adequate source <coughs> that had the means to disseminate such instruction. Now if we assume also that these teachers at a remote time returned to their own lands 
or that the great mercantile centers which they represented were destroyed. Then we have several possibilities. If, for example, during the height of the British colonial theory, <coughs> the British islands themselves had sunk, it would not have meant the complete dissolution of all these different colonial projects. It would have meant, rather, that these projects would have been thrown upon their own resources and in varying degrees of preparedness would have had autonomy thrust upon them. It would also mean that such travelers, merchants, scholars, missionaries, humanitarians, as survived because perhaps they were either on the sea or in these distant regions at the time of the catastrophe, would be uh, required to establish new domicile and probably would remain with the groups where they had created areas of prestige. Thus we may have a phenomenon which is noted among ancient peoples. And that is the curious differences between what might be termed certain aristocratic families within a racial group and the structure of that group itself. Sir Marco Polo, who visited Angkor, the great Khmer center in Indochina, the ruins of which are another unsolved riddle declared that it was perfectly possible to tell the members of the aristocratic and royal family because of the complete difference in the color of their skin and in the structure of their features. Although these people had been born there and had ruled there for centuries, they were not the same stock. Now the legends in that area are also rather explicit, and the concept seems to suggest that in all possibility, the Atlantean group may have lain at the root of dynasties in areas under their control or domination. That, these, that this group intermarried or perhaps selected certain racial stock for the extension of its own sphere of influence and that there may therefore be definite traces of Atlantean blood stream in non-Atlantean peoples who were reached at that time and whose achievements centered around certain heroic groups within their own structure, as for example the caste system in India. We have every reason to believe that this caste system was set up deliberately to prevent the mingling of the bloodstream of the Aryas from the north who were coming down into India and the ancient primitive stock of the Dravidians to preserve the dynamic of the new bloodstream the caste system was instituted there are small caste systems on practically every island of the Polynesians there are small caste systems in every tribe in Africa these caste systems seem to speak of the descent of certain families that had custodial rights at ancient times. And the proof that there was a setting aside is in the structural difference in these classes, a difference which cannot be accounted for by any difference of opportunity or environment or any known difference of racial background. Thus we have the possibility, which has been long affirmed, that the religions of man came from these semi-divine beings. That these religions are all aspects of one faith. That this one faith, or the Vedas, the law, that this faith had its root in some central religious core and may very well have been the religious code of Atlantis. It is very close to the pronouncements given by Plato concerning the nature of this 
code for the government of the Atlantic Islands. Also, although Atlantis was an empire kingdom, the laws were such that they consoled Plato tremendously in the development of his concept of democracy. The liberties, privileges, and rights of the Atlantean peoples indicated a high degree of socialized attainment. This attainment could well be uh, the impetus which caused other peoples receiving it for the first time to feel that it led them out of bondage and brought them a new vision of the dignity of man. This whole po uh, problem, then, would rest upon what would happen if this hub area, as Plato has described, was destroyed in 24 hours, carrying with it to death nearly 60 million human beings. If such a catastrophe occurred, it would mean one of three or four circumstances. First, the breaking down, the collapse of this colonial relationship uh, insofar as those more remote areas which were seldom reached and only occasionally contacted were concerned. Such areas would have only a dim legend at best of some strange person that came to them, changed their way of life and never returned. The second group where more permanent voyaging had set up some type of semi-permanent structure, would have the more clearly defined social impulse to go on, to build empire. A third group, in which perhaps would be involved some of these Atlantean survivors themselves, who thereby took on and took over the rapid progress of certain social and racial groups might have resulted in the rise of the mythological kingdoms of the remote past. These brilliant and wonderful states that came out of nothing and flourished and gained so vast a reputation that men believed that they belonged to the gods. These Atlanteans who stayed could well have been gods walking among men, living with them as Quetzalcoatl is said to have lived for many years, and finally either dying or departing. Uh, one interesting point in connection with this story is that although these gods did come and perform these services and were apparently divine beings, <coughs> most of them are reported to have died two things. Either they went back to the sea or else they remained and died. There are a number of accounts that they did remain and die. As for example the mound for the god of Odin or Votan which is still to be seen the grave near Uppsala in Scandinavia. An ancient monumental mound said to be the graves of the gods that these gods died of various causes is also suggested. And in some instances, the legends are so confused that it seems as though later generations trying to preserve the heroic nature of these deities did not wish to let it appear that they had died. Yet Osiris died at the hand of his brother Typhon. The ancient gods and godlings, though greatly revered, were in a strange way mortal. And out of this mortality came this descent, this benediction by which a new generation of rulers came into existence. And among some tribes these were supposed to be the continuous re-embodiments of the same ruler, as in the case of the Dalai Lamas and Panchan Lamas of Tibet. Thus, many things fitting together fit into Plato's narrative. The problem of disobedience which caused the destruction of Atlantis might also very well play into our situation. 
because these peoples are regarded as the originators of war. And war certainly was among the earliest indoctrinations of mankind. That primitive warfare probably existed in the most primitive society, we do not doubt. But the great political development of warfare also emerges in the dawn of modern time, in the dawn of our historical period. Yet there are scattered about the earth's ancient battlefields in which highly trained troops went into war thousands of years ago, thousands of years before uh, the conquests of Alexander and Caesar, and perhaps long before the siege of Troy. The machines of war, the instruments, and the political and military theories of war also come down to us from a long, long ago. All of the nations had these things, had them as they had the better gifts and wiser givings. And by degrees we see this emergence. We see a great period of glory at the root, at the beginning, a tremendous vir virility, a tremendous vitality of consciousness, the magnificence of Babylon, the transcendent beauty of the great classical civilization of Egypt, the wonderful glory that was Greece, the ancient grandeur that was Rome. We see the ruins of these great achievements, and we perceive also that by degrees these ancient cultures have vanished, and that in their place, in many instances, the peoples involved continually declined. So that gradually the makers of these great cultures vanished entirely. There are no longer any ancient Egyptians. The modern Egyptian is an Arab. His dynasty of old is gone. And history closed him off oh, almost 2,000 years ago. Yet he had a great time and fell into darkness. Why were so many of these great institutions so blackened, so darkened? And why were still earlier ones, of which only myth remains, also uh, always falling away into darkness? It seems that the great vitality of these cultures was imparted from some level of knowledge, from some measure of understanding more dramatic and dynamic than has ever since come to the world. That these early impacts lifted men dramatically to a great achievement. And then came the story of life as we know it. The story which is nothing more than man drifting away from the truths he has learned, compromising, selling out his principles, leaving the ancient footings of ethics and ideals, transgressing the laws of the great beings who came to him in the dawn. They warned him that this would be their own destruction, but the people would not listen. They continued to fall away, so that our history is largely a falling away from the great spiritual foundations and a drifting into material accomplishments, a drifting perhaps which Plato could cover under his concept of another Atlantis in which man is submerged by the sea of his own thoughts and is drowned in the processes of his own mind. In any event, this, I think, is the Greco-Egyptian core of our subject, the farther core from which so much else has to come, and upon which we must build our next consideration, which will be to begin the analysis and examination of the various records in various areas dealing with this subject and the effort we shall make to evaluate them. And we thank you for being with us.